Is the BMW X5 the ultimate seven-seater family wagon? Can a nearly two and a half ton vehicle with all your family in it really be fun to drive? And after nearly four years of ownership, what am I doing? Sticking with the X5 or looking for something else? Let's get into it. Welcome to Dad Cars. Now this is the BMW X5, my wife's daily car. Uh, we've got four young children and a dog, and yeah, we've owned this car for coming up for four years now. So I grew up one of four children as well. My dad, he drove a Mitsubishi Space Wagon, a seven-seater MPV, which kind of looked like a milk carton on its side with windows in. But in fairness to him, back then, seven-seaters, there wasn't much to choose from. However, nowadays, because of the crazy rise and popularity of the SUV, and yes, look, should most people who drive SUVs be driving massive big 2.2 ton things when it's just them driving it or them and one other person? Look, I'm with you, okay? But a byproduct of that is that dads like me, dads with two, three, four plus children who need seven seats, we've got a lot to choose from. And some of them are performance cars. Cars like this, the X5. Now this is a third generation X5 which are from 2014 onwards really, and some late 2013 cars, which actually this is. And you had two previous generations before that, and I've always thought that the X5 is a super cool looking thing. Even when you see the first gen ones now, they're still pretty cool. And then obviously you've got the current generation one as well, which is just a fantastic looking machine. So this is the 30D. Um, you can get slower models than this, and then there's several faster ones as well, the 50D um, and the X5M, which, uh, I mean, the performance stats that those things claim is, is just incredible, it's crazy. So this third generation 30D is 0.7 of a second quicker, zero to 60, than, than the previous generation 30D. And apparently across the range, they're about 17% more efficient anyway. So this is claimed to do around 45 miles per gallon, but I don't think it's that high, it's less than that, but it's not too bad, it's not too bad. Okay, so the nice thing about a car like this is it's got a high roof line, so getting babies and young children into their car seats is a lot easier. But it's not a crazy high ground clearance car either, like a G-Wagon or something, so even young children can still climb into it themselves. Now the boot, is massive. If you've got the rear seats folded down, you can never fill this boot. You can have a double buggy, a single buggy, loads of other bits and bobs, and you can still fit a full shop in on top of all of that as well. It's fantastic. And then if you've got one rear seat up, you've still got a really good sized boot. And then with both rear seats up, you can actually still fit some stuff behind those seats. Now you can't do that in, in all cars that claim to be seven seaters. For example, the um, Discovery Sport, if you've got the rear seats up, you've got no boot. It's also got a split tailgate, which is actually super handy because the way that you cram things in here when you've got young children, uh, if you didn't have it, every time you open the boot, I reckon you'd lose things on the floor. And this split tailgate is also really handy for sitting the children on while you're changing their muddy boots or something like that, or changing a nappy. So I do really like that split tailgate. So in this car, you've got three modes. You've got eco, you've got comfort, and you've got sport. Now driving this in comfort, that's what you're gonna do most of the time. That's why my wife always drives this car just in the comfort mode, that's what it defaults to. But look, driving this car in the comfort mode, you can do it with one finger. This car is so easy to drive. It's fantastic. Now putting it in sport does tighten everything up, so your steering feel gets a bit heavier. Um, and the throttle response is better as well. So, you know, if you're, you're coming up to a slip road or you're at a roundabout and it's a bit busy, you know, you pop it in sport and you do notice a difference. Okay, so the interior in this generation of X5 is a really nice place to be. You know, you've got leather seats all around, which are nice and hard wearing for the children. And it does feel quite nice and solidly built. I mean, this thing squeaks quite a lot, but still a nice, uh, it's a very nice place to be. I like the interior mood lighting, the, like the strip that goes around, and at night time it does look uh, a bit Tron. It's quite nice. And you've got this lovely wide 
fancy looking infotainment system as well which although it looks great is a bit of a chocolate teapot because obviously the infotainment system on this is now rather outdated and sure it's nice to flick through and pick your radio station but connecting it to your phone I mean if you're trying to do your phone by a uh, your iPhone by a cable yeah you can sort of navigate and use Spotify but <sighs> It's a bit fiddly and a bit frustrating, really. So the big flaw then for me, with the X5 as a family car, is that you can't fit three Isofix seats across the middle row here. Now bear in mind, this car is nearly 2.2 meters wide. So why on earth can you not fit three Isofix seats across the middle? I googled how wide a double-decker bus is, and apparently a double-decker bus is 2.55 meters wide, and you can fit four adults across, with a walkway down the middle. Yet you can't fit three Isofix seats in the back of one of these. <laughs> I think it's the Audi Q7 that you can fit three Isofix seats across that middle row. And that's only a little bit, a couple of centimeters wider than this. So that's just really annoying. Also, when you've got the child seats in the middle there, you can't obviously fold the seat forward so that people can get into the back easy. So instead they just got to go up and through the boot. So I've got my wonderful niece joining me on this one today. Hi. <laughs> the first sports car that I ever had was a Toyota MR2, a Mark II one with the T-bar roof. Um, and that, I had that when you were first born. Oh, yeah, so I, I had that about 13 years ago. And that car did zero to 60 in 7.7 .7 seconds. And so to me, that's cemented in my head that 7.7 .7 seconds or quicker is actually still a quick car. Not super quick, but still fairly quick. This car does zero to 60 in 6.9 seconds. Is that, what do you reckon? That was fast. It's not bad, is it? No. Yeah. Now you might ask yourself, why do you need your family car to be quick? Well, if you're stuck at a roundabout and you've got screaming children in the back, that can be quite stressful. Or imagine if you're on a longer journey and then one of the little ones needs to go to the toilet. So you pull over on the hard shoulder on a fast road, cars whizzing by, it's a bit dangerous. You use the potty and then you've got to rejoin the dual carriageway if you've got a car which, is, uh, which has got a bit of pace behind it. It's actually quite handy in those situations. Also, I just think it's fun. Do you think it's fun? Okay, so the acceleration in the 30D, it's not gonna rip the skin off your custard. But I reckon it would in the 50D. But if you test drove a normal MPV, a normal seven seater, and then you jumped in the seat of one of these, I reckon, you'd be quite alarmed and impressed at just the torque and the pull and how you can throw this thing around. And it's definitely a lot of fun. So I was concerned then, picking up a car like this, you know, outside of the manufacturer's warranty, all the electronic gubbins, the four wheel drive, look, it's just more and more stuff to go wrong and it's gonna cost me a lot of money to maintain. But in the nearly four years that we've owned this car, I can only actually think of one thing outside of general servicing and general things that you'd expect to pay on any car anyway. And that was the offside rear air suspension airbag um, failed. So from my experience, I can tell you that these cars are reliable and well built. The Germans know how to do it. Now look, let's be honest. No one buys a car like this for its off-road capabilities. However, we do live in England, and in England it gets wet, it rains a lot, it gets cold, it gets icy. So having four-wheel drive in your main family wagon is actually quite a practical and sensible thing to have.
Now let's talk about the big wide elephant in the room. So you bought yourself a nice fancy SUV like this. You've got all the kids in the back, You've got their pram and everything in the massive boot and you're driving along with your high seating positions, feeling like you've got real road presence and feeling rather happy with yourself until you get to your destination. Because chances are it's not gonna have parent and child parking. And so then you've got the problem of trying to squeeze a big near 2.2 meters wide vehicle into a normal sized parking space. So you spend your time driving around the car park, oh God, trying to find a parking space. And when you do find one, you can't open the doors properly and get the kids out. It's a nightmare. You're gonna end up with car park dings and little scrapes from parking. So you've got two options. You can either stress about that and make the whole owning experience really stressful, or what you do, is you set up a standing order from your bank account going into another one of your bank accounts that you can't easily access. Around about 50 pound a month, say. So you can drive this car around, you can park it without thinking about it because you've already mentally set aside some money to pay to get any little dinks and scratches and scuffs sorted. And I'll tell you what, it makes owning a car like this a lot more enjoyable and a lot less stressful. Okay, let's wrap this video up, shall we? Is the X5 the ultimate seven seat, pound for pound, family king? Well, you know what? If you could fit three Isofix seats across that middle row, I would say undeniably yes. What else looks this good, has this level of performance and drive and enjoyment, is as reliable and as reasonable to maintain as this car, and talking value for money, I think these are tremendous value for money. So what else is there? If you think I'm missing something, please drop it in the comments. So we will be sticking with the X5. And you know what? If I had to change it for something else, it would just be for a faster X5. And if anyone out there has a faster X5 than this, the 50D, the X5M, woo, then please reach out to me, send me an email, because I'd love to do a comparison video. But look, thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, comment, share this video with anyone you think might enjoy it. And look, I'll, uh, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.